Welcome to Dismantling Injustice, the podcast of the Envision Freedom Fund. I'm Julie Menti, Envision's Communications Manager, filling in as host for our Executive Director, Carl Hammond Lipstone. The legal rights and protections afforded to immigrants can be complex and subject to changes in immigration policies and laws, as well as variables such as immigration status and whether someone has had contact with the criminal legal system. That's why access to legal advice and representation is so important. Uh, Referrals to legal services is one of the most requested methods of support Envision Freedom strives to provide to folks we've paid bond for once they've been released from detention. That's where experts come in, like Rebecca Press, our guest today on Dismantling Injustice. Rebecca is a longtime immigration attorney and advocate. She's currently senior counsel at Central American Legal Assistance, and she's worked her entire career to ensure that immigrant communities have access to the legal representation they deserve and need. New York nonprofit media named Rebecca a 2023 trailblazer. Let me start that again. New York nonprofit media named Rebecca a 2023 trailblazer in recognition of her leadership and dedication to making New York a better place. We're thrilled to have her on the podcast. We'll be right back with attorney Rebecca Press after these messages. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Julie. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Great. Um, Well, we want to dive in. I've I've told folks a little bit about you, um, but if you could tell us a little bit more about what brought you to this work and, um, you know, the kind of work you do at uh, Central American Legal Assistance. Sure. Absolutely. I'd love to. So as you know, I'm senior counsel at Central American Legal Assistance. I have only been back with Kala for a little over a month at this point. I have a long history with Kala. I worked there for about six years before sort of going off and doing other things and coming back. Uh, But at Kala, the work focuses on representing mostly asylum seekers, people who are in removal proceedings seeking asylum. Um, with some other work also happening. So there's a lot of work with people who are eligible for TPS or temporary protected status uh, and other forms of relief that people are eligible for in the course of their removal proceedings, but with a real, real focus on helping people seek asylum and humanitarian relief. Um, What brought me to this work is sort of a, it's a big question. It's It's a question about, identity and belief systems. Um, When I think about what brought me to this work or or what this work is really about, I think about how the um, forced migration is an area that really touches on so many of the greatest challenges that we as society are facing today. Uh, You know, it, it touches on how the economic system we have fails humanity, it touches on climate change, it touches on oppressive political systems, Um, it touches on the history of colonialization and how it really impacts everything that is happening today. We see this on full display. Um, And, you know, frankly, I, I am a Jewish person and I can't have conversations like this without touching on the horror that is happening in Israel, Palestine right now. And also recognizing that, you know, I have my own general gener- generational trauma that comes to this work. Uh, the lessons that I've learned as a Jewish person is being taught my whole life that welcoming the stranger is of the utmost importance. Uh, That is all of our responsibilities to try to better the world, to try to pursue justice always. Those values are part of who I am. Um, And unquestionably are part of why I do this work. Uh, And it's how I try to prioritize humanity and, you know, to do the best I can to to make this world a better place, frankly. Yeah. That's um, really beautiful, um, beautifully put, and really resonates with with me. And I think, um, you know, certainly a lot of folks on on our staff and our and our listeners, um, and and really touches on the sort of interconnectedness that Envision Freedom focuses on. That you know, it's not about 
one issue or one problem because they're all connected to each other and we're all yeah. connected to each other. And, um, you know, that's why a lot of, you know, approaches to coming up with solutions and solving problems is kind of a, the answer is usually both and, you know, we need to do this and we need to do this and we're going to do this until we get to this. Right. Um, so, um, you know, I think, I think you bring up a really great point is that, you know, like we, we may be talking about one particular thing today in terms of legal representation um, and access for immigrants for a variety of, of issues and reasons, but, you know, that's connected to things that are, are so much bigger and so much deeper um, and, and really deeply rooted in, in our society and in our values. So thank you so much for, um, for starting us off with that um, and really kind of grounding us in, in this uh, political moment as well. Um, you know, so, so just to kind of zoom in on, on a specific uh, issue that we're, um, you know, contending with in, in New York right now, you know, we've heard from many of our community members that there's really a, a dire need for more immigration legal services in New York. Um, you're on the front lines of, of this that, you know, is that what you're seeing? Is that what you're feeling? And, you know, what are some of the, the key challenges um, organizations like yours, um, uh, attorneys like you are, are facing at this moment? Oh, unquestionably, that is absolutely the reality on the ground. First of all, even before a year and a half ago, when the number of recently arrived immigrants to New York started increasing exponentially, we were already had a great, like a, a lack of legal representation. There weren't enough free legal, free lawyers to go around and already. Add to it the arrival of so many new community members who all need access to legal services and the, the crisis of a lack of legal representation has really just exploded. So absolutely, this is something that both people who need legal representation are feeling and then also the stress on the organizations that do provide legal representation is, is, is just exponentially greater. Um, why is this happening? Uh, there are so many reasons for this. Um, I would say the first is just a lack of investment in the organizations that do this work. There, that I, it would, I would be going too far to say that there's no investment. There certainly is some investment, of course. That's how we're all able to keep our doors open. There's a combination of funding sources between the city, the state, private funders, right? So there is some investment in it, but there's not nearly enough. Um, by that, that that's, there are multiple ways that that impacts the organizations. Number one is not being able to hire sufficient staff. And number two is not being able to pay the staff it has sufficiently well. And so this is um, a reality across, I think, all nonprofits. It's not unique to the immigration nonprofit sector, but we struggle with the ability to pay staff what they should be paid. And so people are earning too little money. They're doing very, very difficult work, both emotionally and substantively. And they're asked to do far too much of it. And what happens? People burn out, right? And so people who have a lot of experience um, may not, you know, they may not stick around. They may decide to go and do something else because the combination of those factors is too overwhelming. Um, there are, we, we certainly have a lot of people who stay in the field uh, and who are committed to the field. Um, and many people who want to stay in the field, but because of those factors aren't able to, um, but there just isn't enough. So number one is not enough funding to hire the quantity of people that's really needed. And number two is the funding doesn't allow organizations to pay their employees what they should be paid. Uh, and those are really two two detrimental factors leading to a lack of representation. 
Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's related to the reality that there is no right to legal representation in removal proceedings. And so people can have a lawyer, but not one at the cost of the government. And so who ends up paying for attorneys is either the individual themselves who pays for a private lawyer or through government funding, private foundation funding, uh, organizations like Kala and others are able to exist and provide free legal services. Uh, but ultimately, it's just not enough. I do want to say that even if there were all the money in the world, I don't know <laughs> that we would ever have enough lawyers or enough representatives, because as you know, in the immigration world, you don't have to be a lawyer to represent someone in removal proceedings. You can be what's called an accredited representative. Um, but I'm not convinced that even if there were all the money in the world, that everyone would have access to free legal services because the work is very emotionally and substantively very, very difficult. And there is probably a limit to the number of people who want to engage with this work. Um, so number one, we could have a lot more funding and do a lot better with uh, creating and, and supporting what I think of as resilient organizations, organizations that can really invest in their employees and um, make it so that people are able to stay in the long term and that there's a greater number of us. Uh, but there's also this background question of, well, even if we all made a million dollars a year, would there still be, uh, and is there a point at which we max out in terms of the number of people who want to do the work? Yeah, yeah, those are incredible points and ones that we probably don't talk about enough. Um, it's bringing to mind a couple of things. One, in terms of burnout, I wanna encourage people to go back to uh, one of our episodes from uh, last season about collective care and, um, you know, it's not self-care, collective care aren't uh, necessarily the same and again bringing up this sort of theme of of connectedness um so we'll we'll drop the the link to that in our in our show notes but but also the idea that you know all the money that we can throw at a problem isn't a solution um these are deeply ingrained issues that you know we certainly see this, you know, in terms of, of paying bond, you know, if we had enough money to pay every single bond, that wouldn't really address the issue of the inhumanity right. of detention, because there are actually so many people who are being held under mandatory detention and aren't even right. eligible for bond. Um, and, you know, that, you know, we're certainly, um, you know, working towards securing freedom for as many people as we can and protecting the rights of as many people as we can. Um, but the roots of the issue are, are much deeper and, and elsewhere. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I would just add to that, that I think you really are touching on sort of like an existential question, which, you know, how much of what we do is frankly, allowing the system to exist how like, by doing the work that we do we are frankly like we're supporting the system in some way would the system i don't know that the system would collapse if we all just said you know we're not we're not participating in this anymore and in the mean in the meantime real individuals who we really can work in the service of would be harmed but i think there are the longer you do this work the more you realize like i am part of this and i am a part of it that is working on behalf of humanity instead of against it but i am part of this and just my mere presence is sustaining a system that I am deeply, that that is deeply troubling and inherently unjust. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it really is an eternal struggle, I think, for people yeah. who, who do this work of, um, you know, straddling this invisible line that shifts. Um, and, yeah. and it's really, it's really challenging. Um, and that's, you know, again, why you know, like we're looking to, you know, to free people and, um, you know, help people in sort of an, an urgent way. And also, you know, 
there are organizations like us and other organizations who are also, you know, working on um, advocating for and pushing for and fighting for like real long term, deep, transformative yeah. change. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can't really do one without the other, um, but it is it is really hard to do both and it's hard to just do one. Um, so I really identify um, with with that struggle. Um, you know, and certainly I think with, you know, the immigration system in this country, you know, long lasting, deep change that will reverberate across the country is going to require congressional action. Um, yeah. That said, like there are measures being taken, certainly at the local and the state levels when it comes to providing immigrants with with legal protection, legal services, and legal access. Could you talk about maybe a little bit of what New York City has done to provide legal assistance and how you would uh, evaluate or critique their response? Sure, absolutely. And this is um, specific to what the city has done over the past year, right? Specifically to be responsive to the needs of the folks who have most recently arrived, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. There are basically three things that I can point at in, in terms of legal services. The city created something called the Application Assistance Help Clinic. I may have gotten that name wrong, but it's the AAHC Help Center, I believe it is. Uh, and the purpose of that center is to provide application assistance for uh, our newest neighbors who are living in the city shelter system and who uh, need to apply for asylum, and now who need to apply for TPS. Um, it's a massive operation. It's run out of what's called the Red Cross Center on 49th Street and 10th Avenue. Uh, and it was, uh, when it was first implemented, it was sort of a trial run, I would say. It was meant to be about six weeks, and then it's it's gotten extended ever since then. It started at the end of June of, of this year. Um, they have filed thousands of asylum applications and are now beginning to do TPS applications. Um, I'm gonna circle back to the AAHC in a second, but I'll tell you about the other things also going on. Uh, the city also is one of the funders of what's called PSPP, which is the Pro Se Plus Project. The Pro Se Plus Project what is a project that was born out of sort of the coming together of a few different small nonprofits. It was on local, which I, where I was the legal director up until very recently, Kala, Catholic Migration Services, MASA, which is a community-based organization in the Bronx, VIA, which is Venezuelan and Immigrants Aid, and NILAG. Uh, those were the original uh, groups that participated. And the idea was, you know, we were just talking about the lack of legal representation. There was no way that all org that organizations were going to be able to be responsive to every single person's individual legal need. So what can we do instead? And the idea, we came up with this idea of what we call Pro Se Plus. So helping people represent themselves, but in a way, giving them the support to do it. Um, so it's a combination of different methods, basically. There are some organizations that do a lot of pro se clinics where they help people file their asylum applications uh, or their work authorization applications, sort of whatever they may need to file. Um, there are other organizations that focus much more heavily on the community education component. Um, and of course, full representation is a component of it, but it's really a marrying of how do we get the information to the communities who need it? And then also how do we actually assist them in doing the work that they need to do? Um, so that project really came to life um, in December of 2022. It was first given funding through the Robin Hood Foundation and New York Community Trust. And then quickly the city was like, oh, hey, wait a minute, we like this idea too. And they then also funded it. Um, and then the one other component from the city is something called ASLAN, the Asylum Seeker Legal Assistance Network, which is the PSPP groups. And then in addition, um, Lutheran Social Services 
CUNY law, CUNY citizenship now, African African um, communities together. Uh, and the idea is to sort of combine what PSPP is doing and make it much bigger, continue to provide know your rights, continue to provide access to asylum assistance or and pro se assistance. Um, I will say, I think PSPP, which I have been deeply involved with and was part of, I was one of the creators of the project when I was at Unlocal and continue to work very heavily on it at Kala. I think it's been wildly successful. We have reached thousands and thousands of people through our community education effort, um, both in person and virtually. Um, and have gotten really, really fantastic feedback. Like it's just been so enormously helpful. Even if people end up going out and finding an attorney, um, to have information about the kind the law that impacts them, even before they start seeking an attorney, is really enormously impactful. Um, to, you know, just to have more awareness of like the law that's impacting their their lives. Also, it's all PSPB has also been incredibly successful with as it pertains to the pro se clinics uh, filed thousands of applications on behalf of people. Um, the city's pro se clinic is um, both has done both good and has limitations to it. Um, I think they really have been trying to help as many people file their applications as possible, which isn't a bad goal in and of itself. Um, I think there are, I think there are parts of the center that are problematic. M uh, mostly the two things come to mind. You know, it's very much, it, it has the air of being a, a legal operation without having the safeguards that legal operations usually are required to have note taking, giving people copies of things, keeping copies for yourself, being able to follow up. The center very much doesn't keep copies of anything and, and very much takes the position that they're not giving legal advice, that it's really just to help, you know, whoever says I want to file this application gets to file an application, um, which, you know, sort of from a, I, I get to say, yes, I want to apply for asylum and then I get to do it. Uh, but there isn't a component of education to it. So there there may be a lack of understanding or not just there may be, there is a lack of understanding of like, well, what does it mean to file for asylum? And why would I maybe not want to do it if I'm, we've started having conversations about this, but the idea that application assistance is the only important piece of the puzzle is something that uh, we've begun to have conversations with the city about. It certainly is an important piece of the puzzle because um, if you apply for asylum, eventually you're eligible for a work authorization. If you apply for what's called TPS, you are protected from deportation and detention and are also eligible for a work authorization. These are unquestionably like very, very important things, right? And it also, it helps people uh, be on the path of uh, of of sort of stability, right? And like beginning to make their new their new lives here. I would never deny that that's important, but it's one component of what's important. And so, sort of being blinded to the rest of the puzzle doesn't actually it doesn't work in the benefit of um, of these new communities. So. You know, I think there has been a lot of good that's happened and there, there's still sort of a whole lot more that can be done. Yeah. I'm sorry yeah. to hear that beeping. Do you hear a beeping? I do hear it. Okay. Sorry. Give me one that's second. Okay. <laughs> Where is that coming from? <laughs> it stopped. So. Probably your Fitbit telling you to get up and move around. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I think you've you've really hit on sort of the two of the biggest issues facing asylum seekers about the deadline to apply for asylum and um, applying for work authorization and, you know, all the things that are at, at stake um, and why it's so important for people to be able to, to do those with, um, you know, informed, accurate um, information. Um, you know, are there any I don't know, wins that stand out for you or cases that you've had that just, 
you know, really speak to to the success and the importance of, of what you're doing. Oh, yeah, I'm going to give you a great example. So um, there was an, an individual who, so I, I just talked about like these different components of the Pro Se Plus project, like one component is the community education, one are the Pro Se clinics. So there is an individual who watched a video that I made. I, I did a video with our partners at VIA, which is Venezuelan Immigrant Aid, about how to prepare your own asylum application. And, you know, if you have to prepare it yourself, these, this is, you know, these are the best practices. So that was a live webinar, but then it's also posted on YouTube. And thousands of people have watched it. And this one individual watched the video filled out his own application, then got connected to um, the uh, to Catholic Migration Services, which is another partner through PSPP, where they helped him with a number of things. They helped him with his uh, employment authorization application and also helped him prepare it, again, not representing him formally, but helped him prepare additional evidence in support of his application. Um, I'm getting this a little bit wrong. Can I back up? Because I just remembered a detail. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I just, okay. So that was slightly right, but a little bit wrong. Uh, okay. So here is a great example of how PSPP has been uh, enormously impactful. Uh, an individual attended one of Kala's clinics where they did his pro se asylum application and he, they helped him file it with court. A few months later, he was eligible for his work authorization and Catholic Migration Services, another organization involved with PSPP, helped him with his work authorization application. I then did a training about how to represent yourself in immigration court. If you can't find a lawyer, if you have a trial coming up, these are things to know about how to represent yourself. Um, what kinds of questions could be asked, what you should really focus on, what kind of evidence you should present. It was a live webinar, but also available on YouTube. And I don't actually know if this person attended live or watched it later, but regardless, he watched the video and, and felt that he learned a lot from it. He then went back to Catholic Migration, who helped him prepare some additional evidence for his case. He then represented himself in court, and he was granted what's called protection under the Convention Against Torture. So it's not exactly asylum, but it is humanitarian protection that allows him to remain in the United States lawfully and permanently. And this was like such an awesome example because here he is like touching all these different organizations in different ways, like both the like pro se assistance and also the, the public education component. I thought that was a great example. And he ultimately succeeded. I've, Amaz it's just amazing. And I think like really, I have forever believed that people with the right information and the right tools really are usually their best advocates, right? <laughs> They're usually. Uh, and so this, this was just a great example of this person had access to that uh, and was able to be successful. So I love that story. I thought, and it, the fact that he touched on so many different organizations and got different things from from each of them was really full. Awful and permanent. Those are yeah. things that you that you love to hear at the, yes. at the end of this process, which can take such a long time. Yeah, too. And yeah. you know, certainly to have so many people have have touched that case to get yeah. that outcome. Um, and, and for somebody to be such uh, a dedicated self-advocate to yeah. seek that out and persist and pursue um, is, is really um, amazing as well. Yeah, it's um, really amazing. You know, I, I want to think, too, about, um, you know, people kind of having the right information. Um, and, and certainly, you know, we're seeing at, you know, the, the state level, um, sort of just in terms of people having information, like, you know, the thing I can think of is the Fair Courts for uh, Immigrant New Yorkers bill that um, passed the state legislature and is still waiting for Governor Hochul's uh, signature. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what, what that, what kind of protection that would give to immigrant New Yorkers who have contact with the criminal legal system 
and um, you know why it's so important that that the governor sign it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so the the fair court fair courts for immigrant New Yorkers bill would essentially require that judges in the criminal legal system provide clear and accurate warnings about what the potential immigration consequences are to a defendant who's taking a plea or who has been um, convicted of a of a criminal of a criminal charge. This will come as no surprise to anyone listening, but often the immigration consequences of a criminal conviction are the most devastating. People can be detained by ICE. They can be put into removal proceedings based on what a criminal defense attorney might describe as a pretty minor crime or, and what may in fact in the criminal legal system appear to be a pretty minor crime, but it has major, major lifelong consequences if the, if it, uh, if, if immigration and customs enforcement ICE gets wind of it. And that's true whether it's a, it's, um, a criminal conviction that makes someone mandatorily sort of like they have to start removal proceedings against them or whether it's a, di a discretionary decision. The example that comes to my mind immediately uh, is for folks who have been convicted of DWIs, driving while under the influence. These sometimes are fairly minor criminal offenses that have major impact on immigration status. They often lead to ICE detention. It is very difficult to get an immigration judge to grant bond um, when an individual has, you know, multiple or even just one DUI uh, because it's considered to be a crime that is dangerous to society. Uh, and it's very hard for someone to demonstrate that they are not in fact a danger to society when they have a DUI, unless it was, you know, pretty, pretty long time ago. So this may be, but DUIs in the criminal system are often not considered to be that serious, but they have devastating, truly, truly devastating impact on uh, immigrate on, on the future of the individual because they're detained by ICE, they can't get out, they have to fight their case while they're in detention, and they may in fact actually be deported. Uh, so it's really critical that when taking a plea, when being convicted of a crime, the person understand, they may still make the decision, right? They still may decide this is the right choice for me to take this, this plea, but they have to understand the potential impact on their immigration case and on their future in the United States. Otherwise, it's you know not really an informed decision. Um, and frankly, I'm not sure why the governor hasn't signed it yet. I don't know if you know, Julie, but I don't, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I I don't know. A, a lot of it just comes down to to politics, um, and uh -huh. governors yeah. often wait until the very end of the year to sign things in into law, um, particularly okay. in you know contentious election years. Um, kind of want to uh -huh. avoid yes. anything that might be a political hot potato, although this certainly shouldn't be. <laughs> um, right. But yeah. Uh, but yeah. Um, you know, I think you've done an incredible job of, of highlighting, you know, how, uh, you know, like the bill sounds really simple. It's like, oh, you're informed of the implications that could have on your immigration case, but it, it's, <laughs> it's significant. Yeah. It's a, it's a huge, huge, um, uh, a huge, huge thing that would have impact on, on people to, to, again, have the right information to make, um, the best possible choices um, they can for um, uh, for protecting their their status in this in this country. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, you know, like there's just it's been incredible. Our the notes section for this episode is going to be very full with um, the organizations <laughs> you've mentioned, the resources that you've mentioned, because um, we want to make sure that um, we share that information with with folks. Um, and, you know, I think you've done an incredible job of, of demonstrating, you know, how, um, you know, how successful outcomes, um, can really change people's lives and, 
uh, and strengthen our communities when when families can stay together, when communities can stay intact. Like this is this is important for all of us, and not just um, the individuals who are who are facing um, these challenges with the, the immigration system. Um, you know, when when people corner you at a at a cocktail party, um, what are you telling them about? You know, like what what they can do um, to either support your work um, or to support sort of you know these these issues in general, and you know, you're even like the you know the larger um, the larger picture that we're facing that um, you were talking about earlier. What are what are the things that you think people sh can channel their energy into um, that can provide tangible, um, tangible actions, concrete actions, and and give people a lot of hope in what can feel like really dark times. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I think there are a lot of things people can do. I think that there are a lot. I'm gonna. I will. I will. I'm gonna answer this question in full. Um, First of all, I want people to change the narrative in their brain. I think we've heard a lot from leadership in the city about how this is a crisis, how migrants are ruining New York City. I think I think I read that. I think the mayor literally said that this is you know destroying New York City. Change that narrative, and I wish the mayor would himself. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for abundance. This is an opportunity to welcome new neighbors, to increase the joy and, and, and you know, ensure that our city continues to thrive. Think about it like that, because that is the truth. That is what immigrants to New York have always done. And there's really no reason why this is going to be any different. So stop, don't buy into this narrative of crisis and fear and chaos, because that really, you won't get to a next step of what we can do if you're so consumed with fear and, you know, this is a crisis. So number one, change the narrative in your mind if you need to. These listeners, the listeners here may not need to do that, right? They may already agree that this is an opportunity for growth, creativity, abundance. But I would just keep reminding yourself of that. Um, number two, uh, I think there are... There are, there are like immediate needs that need to be met. For example, winter is right around the corner. I'm already freezing when I walk outside. Many of our newest neighbors don't have coats, right? They don't have sweaters. They don't have scarves. Pay attention to the groups in your neighborhoods, and they exist literally everywhere. They exist all over New York City, and figure out where can I donate that coat from last year that I don't like anymore? We all have so many clothes, right? Like we, this is just part of our reality. Truly do that. Donate your clothes, donate your kids' clothes because people really need it and it makes a big difference. Um, you might think it's small, but truly people don't have basic things like a scarf or gloves or a hat or boots for their kids, which are, boots are incredibly expensive. So if you have another pair of boots or an old pair of boots that are in decent shape, please find a place to donate. And again, if wherever you live, if you're on social media of any kind, you can look for mutual aid, Kensington, Brooklyn, mutual aid, you know, Jackson Heights, right? Name your neighborhood and it will come up. And that's where you can, that's a starting point at least. Um, let's see, what else? <laughs> Number two, um, I do think it's important to be in touch with our representatives at all levels. So our city council members, our representatives in, in the House, our senators. I know there are so many issues that are important right now, but this is one of them. And this is, you know, how we respond to our newest neighbors really does call into question, who are we? What, what do we believe in? And so keep talking to your representatives about what you think needs to happen, what you wish you would see. I mean, one of the things that, um, that I've really been sort of struggling with is the lack of access to housing in New York City. And I know this issue goes so far beyond our, you know, the recently arrived, right? We have a real uh, a real crisis of affordable housing in New York City, and that's been true for years. We also have so many new apartment buildings, and we have so many empty 
um, uh, office buildings at this point, is there not something that city government can do to figure out a longer term affordable housing solution? This is not to suggest only for recently arrived immigrants, right? This is like truly for all of New York City, but let, you know, let's call on our local leaders to think creatively about the use of the empty space we have right now, instead of putting people on Randall's Island, where even in 75 degree weather, they're going to, you know, that's it's a difficult location to be. Uh, this, you know, the, I guess the last thing I'll say is um, support organizations that are doing this work, right? Donate to Kala, donate to Unlocal, donate to the other organizations. I do want to take a, a second, I hope it's okay, to tell you about another project that I'm working on, which is called Co-Council, um, which is a our 501c3 status is pending, but we will be a nonprofit. And the idea behind co-counsel is to increase or sort of transform collective capacity to navigate this very complex immigration legal system. It's like to tap into the potential that exists, both within individuals who are grappling with the immigration system themselves. And then also, and sometimes this is overlapping, but also with um, legal communities that aren't yet tapped into this work. Uh, I think that there's a lot of desire within law firms or companies that have legal teams, but they don't have the support they need to do this work. So at co-counsel, we wanna give them that support so that they can start so, so that we expand access to legal services. That's one component, but the other component really is this belief in the communities themselves and their ability to, with the right resources, with the right support, with the right tools, they're able to advocate for themselves, which they're already doing, right? But better able to do that. Um, and so this, this new idea called co-counsel formed where that, that's really our vision, right? To advocate for themselves in the best way possible and also to expand access to legal representation. So, you know, support organizations like co-counsel, support organizations like Kala, support the people that are doing the work so that we can do it with more people and we can do it in a sustainable way, which sort of ties back to what I was saying earlier. Um, it's, it all, it's all true. <laughs> We, we need all of the above. Um, I hope I, I hope I gave some good ideas about what people can do because it does, it feels so, there's so many challenges right now and how, where do you begin is, is um, there are answers to it. And I hope I was able to give some um, support organizations like Envision Freedom Fund, which I don't know if you know this, Julie, but Envision Freedom Fund bonded out many, many of my clients. I had a whole practice, which was called rapid response, where people who had um, already been ordered removed were detained by ICE. And it's an incredible resource. And it just, you know, support organizations like Envision Freedom Fund, and you will be supporting immigrant communities in the United States. So, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, there's, there's just nothing better than, um, you know, knowing that you had some part, um, no matter how big or how small, in securing someone's freedom um, yeah. and protecting their rights. Um, you know, just yesterday we had uh, uh, a community member come into the office who just got freed from detention after we paid his bond. Um, and it was incredible to get to see him in person and to, and to welcome him home. And, you know, and that's just the beginning. Um, yeah. Of, of what's ahead for him and for us and for the work that you do. Um, and I think, you know, you've given people a lot of, of things to think about and a really great spectrum of, of ways to, to be involved and um, to support people who are, who are part of our community, who are part of our city and, yeah. and, and need a warm welcome, which they are not getting um, yeah. enough of. Um, right. So, so thank you so much for joining us again. Um, we've been joined by Rebecca Press, who is the senior counsel at Kala. Um, make sure you hit up the notes section of this podcast. It's going to be chock full of resources that you're going to want to share with your friends and family. Um, and please like and subscribe to Dismantling Injustice um, so that you don't miss any uh, conversations like this one. Thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca. 
Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks, listeners. Until next time.